Hello, Ray Phoenix here. Welcome to Let's Play Ape Escape Pre Part 9. So now we're going through to some frozen icy level yet again. Yeah, another ice level. Just what this game needs. And again, the first game had free ice level, so I guess it makes sense this game had more than just one ice level. So we're going to a level that's clearly a parody of the Titanic, which is supposed to be one of the highest grossing films ever, especially released during the winter time, which is clearly when this level is set. During the winter time, so according to Mr. Plinkett, winter is the new summer for movies. Titanic originally is going to come out in the summer, I think, of, two, of 1997, but then they later changed it to winter 1997, because winter is where the real money is made. Kids are off school, people are off work, they're just the Christmas holidays. What else are you going to do then? But go to the movies and watch, you know, movies in the theaters. So I guess that's why a lot of movies like to come out at Christmas time. You know, the Disney Star Wars movies seem to like to come out at that seems like to come out at Christmas time now. Christmas time or, or winter time seems to be like the new summer for movies. All the best movies come out in the winter nowadays. And this icy level where the Titanic is clearly crashed and ice is going to be flowing up into it. And there's one monkey that thought he could escape from us here, but no, we captured him on this. These ice, these, these what do you call these ice glaciers at the Titanic or the Bananic is what I think it's called. Just crashed into this big, large ship. Yes, yeah, so I don't trust going on cruise ships. It's a classic story when technology failed us. You put so much faith into technology, and it fails us. I keep getting the idea my computer's gonna do that one of these days. My computer's probably gonna fail me one of these days, and my smartphone's gonna fail me one of these days, or something's gonna fail me one of these days, and I'll be like, I trusted you, and now you betrayed me. After so much time of trusting, of being so trusting of your technology, it's gonna betray you. Technology always betrays us all the time. And now we're going, now we're using this boat that Zaki's face on it with no mention of Dr. Phil on it. And now we can, we could paddle down the, this icy, this, this icy, what do you call it, like an icy river for this icy cavern. And, 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 and apparently the gadgets are, are enough to keep us warm. It's probably icy as hell on this level. It's like an icy frozen tundra in this level. But for some reason we don't freeze up. Well, then again, Axel never got frozen up in those ice levels in Twisted Metals 2 and 3. But then again, he's probably some superhuman being thing that can, that brought thought drives in that thing. It looks like an Axel with the two wheels on it. So we're going after, yeah, another mini boss. Another standard routine mini boss like thing that we've seen quite so many times already in this game. And he still has his wind up keys on him, which are very, which are obviously like a large target for our weapons. The Fantasy Knight, the best thing we can use, the best fighter in the game, the Fantasy Knight, to destroy him off easy. Just hit him a bunch of times. I hit him in his weak point a bunch of times. But this overly powered stun club, yeah, the sword isn't really even a sword. Just an overpowered stun club. Well, it's like a stun club mixed with a magic punch from I'm going to try it from Ape Escape 1 2, but then again, I don't think there's anything in this game that could exclusively only be opened up with this overly powerful sword, at least nothing that I know of. Because it would have been Ape Escapes 1 and 2. There were a lot of things that you could break in those games, but you couldn't but you couldn't break them if you didn't have the magic punch. That's why you get the magic punch, then you can break open all those things. You could break them and find like hidden monkeys and things. There's usually monkeys hiding in them. I don't think there are anything. I don't think there is anything like that in Ape Escape Free, simply because there's no magic punch in Ape Escape Free. For I thought, ah, magic punch is being a bit too cliche. We need something more original. So they gave so instead they make gave us a special morph thing we're gonna get. Morph fear we're gonna get when we beat the game. Yeah, you probably figured there'd be some sort of special morph thing, considering this game is really strong. This game has a very strong emphasis on morphing and going becoming different things. And there, that monkey lost his pants over there. You can see the yellow pants over there, which indicates monkey is just a regular yellow pants monkey, an average typical monkey. And he's a super hoop to get through this win. I wonder what who carved that thing. It must be some sort of artificial. I don't see some sort of artificially made like um monkey. It's just blowing air out out at us like icy cold. There's probably icy air too. But again, ice always blows away heat. I mean, our watches produce heat a lot of the time. I mean, they always produce heat, but it's, it's, it's such a small amount of heat, it can easily get blown off by wind and things like that. It doesn't really produce much heat at all. I mean, I often put on two watches when I go out and about to keep me warm and protected, but it's kind of a redundant thing, but I still like to do it anyways. So now we're going to meet the big man himself, Santa Claus. Yeah, Santa Claus is supposed to be coming here. Santa's here. Yeah, I was just watching that Rugrats Christmas special. Is that that's that part where Angelica pulls off the fake mall Santa's beard? And then she's like, it's not Santa! It's a fake! When Buddy the Elf did that, he got arrested. When Angelica did that, the store fell bad for her, so they gave her a lot of free toys. And none of them were any toys that they want because Angelica's a spoiled brat. 
And then she ended up getting coal for Christmas. She wakes up every morning and she wakes up and she's like, coal, nothing but coal. There's a lot of presents in her tree. And well, that's what you get when you pick on Santa Claus. You get coal. I remember one time I wanted to wake up my cousin once. I put on a Santa Claus mask and I went into and I went into the her bedroom and I said, oh, 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 Merry Christmas. If you don't get out of bed now, you're going to be on the naughty list. And she smacked me in the gut. I'm like, oh, you smacked Santa in the gut. Well, you're definitely on the naughty list now. <laughs> And then Angelica called that numbers asking, am I on the naughty list or the, the good list or the bad list? Well, you're on the bad list. Uh, thanks for calling. Bye. The fact that he said thanks for calling afterwards is what really like made it so funny. I need to say that to people when they call me for stupid stuff. I can be like, oh, yes, sir. I can just I'm sarcastic give them an answer. It's against their favor. And then afterwards, I say, thanks for calling. Bye. <laughs> You know, if you all those kids at Christmas time, they're always like, you know, they're always so concerned about, oh, was I bad this year for Christmas? Am I going to get nothing but coal for Christmas? And they're always, kids are always concerned about that. Kids always, always fear stuff like that. Kids are always in fear. I mean, everyone's in fear all the time, too, thanks to what the news teaches. That's what things I'm not, we're expected to believe. So we're always living in fear. But kids, they fear the most trivial things ever. In fact, I have a friend in real life that's 25 years old, and he says that, then he says that, uh, waking, he says that, um, what's he gonna say? Oh yeah, go waking up on Christmas morning, finding nothing under the tree to him is a tragedy worse than 9-11. Yeah, to kids, that is a pretty bad tragedy to wake up on Christmas morning and find nothing under the tree. Apparently that was the case of that kid in that movie Bad Santa, what was his name, Furman Merman? Man, where, where he did not get anything at all for the last few years in a row. And same with those, those, same with those, those trailer kids from those Lampoon, that Lampoon movie, Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. We were good all year and we got nothing. So what's the point of being good if you don't get anything for Christmas? <laughs> Some kids would say, what's the point of being good? And that's how and that's how criminals are made. I bet that's how a lot of serial killer stories begin, where they didn't get anything they wanted for Christmas. <laughs> so they became a serial killer. Or some sort of crook. I wonder if that's what happened to Richard Nixon. I mean, that's why Richard Nixon was such a crook, was because he never got anything good for Christmas. <laughs> So there's those musical notes there. He says genie dancing. This thing that looks like a wannabe Robin Williams that just dances to its own music and it can be used to any monkey that hears that music so just gets this break I know dance. And now pretty much every monkey in this game can easily be captured by us now because it can just, you know, dance to the music pretty much. And we have, you know, the greatest weapons of all, musical warfare. Musical warfare actually is a thing in real life where people play music. To, you know, that's like a means, that's like a weapon. And I, also, I kind of got the idea of that from the movie Small Soldiers, in that part where the, where the commando elite force, or whatever it was called, where Major Chip Hazard uses the song Wannabe by Spice Girls, and she and he blares it loud as a means of fighting against the enemy. Musical warfare. I've done stuff like that before in real life. Actually, is a really, you know, good way to fight against enemies sometimes. It probably is one of the best non-destructive ways to combat people. The non-destructive, non-lethal weapons always are the best kinds of weapons to use against people. That's like what that guy from Mystery Men was saying when he says that he invents the best non... what do you call them? The best non-lethal weapons. You know, that's, you know, you come using the best non-lethal weapons, you know, it's... And, I mean, there aren't really any lethal weapons in this game either. This game seems to know that very well, which is why you know, all we really have is a stun claw, which can really only destroy those evil teleborgs. Because pretty much every um, enemy in this game is some sort of teleborg or some teleborg. We don't really see very many non-teleborg enemies in this game. I mean, over earlier Ape Escape games had like, had, like, enemies that'd be, like, creatures that could inhabit the worlds you go to. Or sometimes it would be, or even in Ape Escape 2, sometimes we'd come across, like, like these bird things. They also look like enemies out of Kirby, this tomato bird thing. Which is more Nintendo influence. Cause, yeah, you, since the first game, I keep constantly saying that. No, Ape Escape does have a lot of heavy Nintendo influence in it. And I, I really noticed that too in the first two games. Even this game has some Nintendo influence, but not really as much as the first two. As much. This one's more like movie and TV influence. Like right now, we're going after Indiana Jones. Or AP Jones is what he's actually called. And there's these treasure chests you can open up, and there might be treasure on the inside. You just have to destroy that thing, and look at that, we just got rewarded for crap load of treasure. Just like what we did at that casino level in Ape Escape 2, where you destroy the slot machines there. Where they allowed kids to destroy the slot machines in that level is a way of saying that, you know, slot machines, you know, suck, pretty much. And we have to, they, they did that in this game too, there's a level that's gonna be later in this game where we have to take on slot machines, fight slot machines head on, head to head. 
If Indiana Jones is just gonna use his gun on us and we could just defeat him easy, he always used his gun. You remember a time he got into a sword fight with someone and he just took out his gun and shot him and killed him easy right there on the spot. That's what he wants to do to us. We got plenty of health to, you know, we got plenty of health. We don't have this one health left. That guy shot must have only had one health left. So there's a golden monkey that we could capture. Golden Mun, he's not Golden Monkey, he's Golden Mun. Oh, well, sounds like he's becoming Jamaican for a sec. Hey, Golden Mun, give me some, just give me some, and you're like, Golden Mun, let's listen to some Bob Marley Mun, you know, like that. <laughs> golden Mun, yeah, that does sound like, that does sound maybe it's like there's some more, I don't see like reference really to, I know, I know it's supposed to be short for monkey, but that could very well be the only reference to any like, to like Jamaican slang or stuff in this game. Kind of like how Min Jumping Flash too, in the, in the dot, where it lists the name of the characters, Captain Kabuki is referred to as Capito Kabuki or something like that, which is the only, or Capito Suzuki or something like that, which is the only real reference to the Portuguese language that came, because Capito is supposed to be, I think that's what it is, it's supposed to be Portuguese for Captain, but for some reason that's the only reference to, that's the only time Portuguese ever appears in any of the Jumping Flash games, was in Jumping Flash 2. It seems like an odd place to, to be the only part of the entire franchise that makes any kind of reference to the Portuguese language. So again, it's not even set on Earth. It's supposed to be set on planet Little Moo, which is supposed to be some planet that's, I don't know, it's in the bathwater reaches of the galaxy. I have no idea where that even is in relation to anything else. It's not a galaxy that really exists. I doubt we could see it if we look up at our stars. We'd be able to see what, where this galaxy is. And so we're in some town, looks like it could very well be just some bootleg Agrabah or somewhere like that. We'll probably come across Aladdin doing, doing, doing his stuff, you know, being a street rat and stealing from people. And, we'll, and we're gonna have to steal him from these monkeys as we have to capture him. Look at that, we get to steal Kapo Mon, yeah, Kapo Mon, he's in a cup. For some reason they named him after a cup. They knew you get a job being in a cup. And look at that, it's in a rug store apparently too. There's rugs in the wall, and of them are magical. That could allow us to fly. This is a very magical place. You know, Agrabah's the most magical place you could, you could think of actually that could exist in real life. There's all sorts of like Middle Eastern magic. And I mean, Indiana Jones tries to like reflect on the fact that, oh, oh, that there's all sorts of religious powers in the world, especially in Temple of Doom when, he, when there's that when there, when there, when, when, he, when there was that religious guy that ran over, that ran that whole scam and involved kidnapping kids, making them work in slave labor, pretty much for his big religious scam. A lot of people say religion is kind of a scam. My Jason and Mason series vaguely hints at that by having it. Oh, the real religion, in the world is ultraversism because, well, because that's how it is. That's not. That's not how we. That's not. That's not. We think it is, that is actually how it is. It's not really much of like a belief anymore because it's just, well, it's improving that's what it is. And that all the other religions that could exist are bull crap, essentially, according to Jason and Mason. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got through the, these Arabian monkeys and now we're going to come across the next level of the game. We're actually going to do the next level in this game. We'll be introduced to the next level of this game. Aki's just going to... You know, blabber on about all those monkeys we just captured. 14 monkeys, yeah. And oh look, something's coming up. Another boss. The boss will take on in the next video. But we will still see the introduction to this boss. What? What's going on? Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to present the diva of the Freaky Monkey 5. Her beautiful face is enough to drive any monkey wild. And now, here she is in her first lead in a musical performance, Monkey Pink! Now don't you dare mess up my premiere! Do you understand me? Yeah, so we have to fight against this brat again in the next video. This is Ray Phoenix signing out.